My name is Maria Kartovich. I am the executive director of the Clausen Center for International Business and Policy. This event today, this lunch, is organized jointly by the Clausen Center and the Haas School, which has a series called the Dean Speaker Series. So they have been very helpful, and they are uh, the Haas School uh, um, management is here as well. So today we have a panel entitled Brexit, What's Next? And we have four very distinguished panelists that uh, will discuss this from various points of view. I will tell you their names and their um, subjects in a little bit. But before that, I wanted just to uh, make a couple of uh, announcements. Each panelist will talk for about 10 minutes, and then we will open the floor to your questions. The only thing that I need you to do is to please step up to the mic here in front to ask your question, because this is being taped, and that way we will hear everyone's question well. Um, the panelists today are um, first Professor Andy Rose, the Bernard Roca Chair in International Business and Trade at the Haas School in the Economic Analysis and Policy Group. Next to him is Dr. Galina Hale, research advisor of the risk modeling research section of the San Francisco Federal Research, uh, Federal um, uh, Bank, I'm sorry, in the research department. Next to her is Professor Barry Eichengreen, the George and Helen Pardee Professor of Economics and Professor of Political Science. And to my uh, left at the end of the table, is Professor Gerard Roland, Maurice Cox Professor of Economics and Professor of Political Science. They will uh, soon uh, enlighten us about what's next for Brexit. And perhaps as a two minute introduction, uh, let me just state that the European Union is uh, composed today of 28 countries with 500 million people. Um, the European Union has rules for easy trade of goods and services and movement of people. The United Kingdom, three months ago, vote, voted uh, by a, a majority to leave the uh, European Union, called Brexit, to su the surprise of many people, many of us, and therefore, both England, the European Union, and the rest of the world are dealing today with the question of what does this mean? What's next for the UK, the European Union, the United States, and the world? To discuss this, first from an international trade perspective, uh, let's, let me give the floor to Professor Andy Rose. <clears throat> Okay, um, is my mic, uh, I guess my mic is hot. <clears throat> okay, so I'm supposed to be speaking about um, the effect of Brexit on international trade and what you should think about. Okay, so just to make sure that we're all on the same page, the UK exports goods and also services to the rest of the world and it imports goods and services from the rest of the world. And the question is, what does the decision um, that they took at this referendum to leave, what is that gonna have on, on their commercial relations? Okay, now, the first thing that you want to do is just have a brief statistical overview about what's happening in the UK, what sort of country it is. Okay, so uh, usually we measure these things relative to GDP, and Britain exports um, about 28% of, of um, its GDP. So it's, a, it's quite an open economy. A lot of its stuff that it produces goes abroad. Now, 28% sounds good compared with, for instance, the United States. The United States exports around 13% of, of, of its output. Um, and Britain is a pretty big exporter. It's the, it turns out it's the 11th largest um, global exporter. But you don't want to overstate how, how open it is. So Germany, which is where all the power is in Europe, um, Germany is a much larger economy and it exports 46% of its GDP. So you don't want to overstate this. 
Um, imports and exports are approximately the same, um, and the UK is a big importer, okay? It's the number six global importer, and we'll come back to that. Because it exports less than it imports, the United Kingdom runs a current account deficit, okay? And it's not trivial. The usual thing that we, we teach at Haas is a current account deficit that is more than around three percentage points of GDP raises question marks. And the UK is at 4%, so it's above that, that trigger mark, and it's persistently high. So they're persistently importing more stuff than they're exporting, so, and, and that's an issue that just has to be dealt with. Okay, who do they trade with? Okay, well, um, just less than half of all British exports go to the EU. Okay, so really, we just, I just want you to remember gross facts, so call it half. It's actually more than half because half of British exports go to the other 27 members of the European Union, but the EU has trade relations with a bunch of other countries, okay, and the, um, the UK's terms are the same as the EU's, so EU-related trade is almost two-thirds of all British exports, okay. Now, that's a big deal. By way of comparison, only about a tenth of the European Union's exports go to the UK. So Britain cares way more about where its stuff is going vis-a-vis -vis the EU than the EU cares about the, the UK. Now, that's especially important because if you look at what the UK exports, so there's a little bit of North Sea oil that, that's going out and some agricultural stuff, but a lot of it is manufacturing and services, especially financial services, where close ties between the EU and the UK are really important, okay? So if you, if you export in manufacturing, you're also importing in manufacturing. That's what global supply chains are all about. Lots of your inputs are, 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 are um, sent abroad. Some of the stuff that you export is unfinished. They're intermediate inputs, okay? Um, so harmonization of regulation, especially in financial services, is really important to the UK, okay? And now they have that deal with the, with the European Union, and the question is, what's it gonna be like in the future? Okay, so I want you to have this view. The UK is pretty open. They're strongly dependent upon sending stuff um, to the EU. The EU isn't nearly as concerned about the stuff that it's sending to the UK. Okay, um, so that's a, a, a brief overview. What does the economics literature say about the importance of Brexit? Okay. So we don't really know because most of the, the estimates are based upon models that we have a limited amount of confidence in. Most of the estimates that you see um, from academics, and there is a pretty comprehensive study by the LSE, but the IMF did a, did a study, um, the UK Treasury did a study, um, most of them say that the, the disruption associated with Brexit is going to lead to a drop in income of around two percentage points of GDP. Now, two percent, that's not a huge deal. On the other hand, it's a lot of hamburger. I mean, really, it, it adds up. And that's sort of the immediate effect. The long run effect is going to be larger, almost everyone thinks, because being open to international trade, and this the Brexit will surely make the UK um, more closed, um, being open to trade is really good for the economy in a large number of ways, many of which we don't really understand very well, but it especially affects productivity. You want to think of high productivity countries which produce a lot of, of output from very little inputs. You don't think of North Korea. You don't think of Cuba. You don't think of sub-Saharan African countries. You think of open economies. And the LSE estimates is, um, are that... Um, the long run effects of Brexit, um, because of closing the economy, are gonna be between six and 10 percentage points of GDP, which is not small. Okay, a few things to remember, because I don't, I don't wanna take too much of your time. First, the UK has always been extraordinarily open to trade. So they were really the country that ushered in the period of free trade when the Industrial Revolution um, started in the middle of the 19th century. And just to make sure that you're aware, that's the reason why the, the Royal Navy was a big deal, because it kept open the sea lanes for free trade. Britain is already more open than most countries in the rest of the world. Okay, and, and it's always been that way, but that also means that it has relatively few concessions to give away. If it's trying to, to do a deal with another country, it can't say, I will liberalize here because they're already pretty liberal. 
Here's another thing. Because they're more open than most countries, they're a very popular destination for foreign direct investment because they serve as a very stable export platform for the European Union. So most of the Asian countries, like Japan and Korea and China, if they're establishing a base in the European Union to do business there, start off with the UK. Okay, and that's gonna be in jeopardy associated with Brexit. That's especially true in, in financial services, but it's also true in important other things. There's no such thing as a British car company, but plenty of cars are produced by foreign com um, companies in the UK. Okay, same thing is true in aerospace and things like that. Okay, more immediately now, what does Brexit mean in terms of trade? The UK needs a new trade deal with the European Union and there are 27 complicated, idiosyncratic countries in the European Union. Negotiations between the UK and the EU are gonna be painstaking and they're very politically fraught. All trade barriers of any importance are non-trade barriers, non-tariff barriers. So they're not associated with like a tax or something like that. They're associated with regulatory um, convergence, harmonization of, of uh, <clears throat> safety regulations or things like that. Those things, the non-tariff barriers, are always protected by special interests. So that's why trade negotiations take a long time all the time, okay? Um, just to give you an, an example, um, Canada, started a free trade um, area negotiation with the, the UK, excuse me, with the European Union. That began in 2007, and it hasn't been concluded and executed yet. And they're Canadian, okay? So they're not trying to, to rip off the, the European Union's. Um, any free trade area with the European Union is gonna take a really long time for the British to negotiate, especially since the European Union is gonna to wanna to punish the UK so as to deter other countries from exiting soon. So the idea that they're gonna get a new trade deal anytime soon, certainly within the two years that's allowed by Article 50, I think is simply dreaming. But the UK needs more than just a deal with the European Union. They need a new trade deal with the rest of the world because right now the EU negotiates on behalf of all of its members with the rest of the world. Now, it's way easier to do a deal with the rest of the world inside the apparatus of the EU, okay? Um, the EU has an enormous bureaucracy, okay? The European Commission, that's why Brussels has such great restaurants so that you can bribe the uh, <coughs> civil servants who work for the Commission, okay? And the EU already has deals currently with over 50 other countries. All of that stuff gets thrown away when the UK leaves the European Union, okay? And nobody else is gonna wanna negotiate with the UK until their situation with the European Union is clarified. So that's an entire nexus of, of, of trade deals that have to be negotiated. And meanwhile, the number of British trade negotiators that were working for Her Majesty's government three months ago was zero because all of the trade negotiations were done through the EU. So they've been hiring people like crazy, but they don't have the bureaucracy. They don't have the, the civil service to deal with this problem. Okay, sooner or later, they're going to have to renegotiate everything with the World Trade Organization. There are 27 idiosyncratic countries inside the EU. There are over 50 other deals, okay, that the EU has with other countries. And there are 163 members of the World Trade Organization. None of those fora operate quickly. Remember how quickly the Doha round for trade liberalization worked through the WTO? It's not been finished. It started 15 years ago. Okay, so sticking with the status quo would be far superior, as far as most econo economists and my, myself are concerned, to any likely outcome that the um, UK um, is gonna get out of the EU. It then lends the, uh, lends the question, can the UK just technically exit but retain access to the single market? Well, a few countries do like that, um, do have a deal like that, like Norway and Switzerland, but they basically have to buy the entire apparatus of the single market, and the single market says, if you're a member of the single market, you have, have to provide free access to goods, services, labor, and capital. But people voted to leave the European Union so that they didn't have free flow of labor. They want to cut off immigration. They want to be able, the British want to be able to control immigration themselves. So it seems to me that there is simply no way that they're going to get 
a deal like Switzerland or Norway has. They won't have access to the single market because that would be completely inconsistent with the whole Brexit referendum. So unless they can figure out some fudge, which I, I hope they do, they're leaving. Trade outside the single market is going to be painful and expensive. Okay. Um, all right. Let me conclude. I want to bring myself back to Earth a little bit because so far everything I've been saying has said uh, has implied we were, we're going to get really negative outcomes out of this for the UK. Free trade agreements aren't really that important. They help. They're a, they're a good thing. They they improve welfare, but most trade barriers are already eliminated. So you don't want to overstate the importance of these. Even if you look at the most pro-free um, traders, they would say that, for instance, um, the economic consequences of Brexit you know, are not going to be that substantial. Don't expect a collapse of living standards of 20%. They're going to be much smaller. Here's the second thing. Linkages of trade, you know, when a, a company in one country like the UK decides to export to another country, okay, that relationship takes a long time to develop. It's very expensive. It's maintained. So trade linkages are developed slowly and disappear slowly. Okay, trade improves welfare. Okay, but you know these things are very persistent. So you shouldn't expect anything that shocking. So where do I come down? I think the UK is heading for a long period of slow trade stagnation. Um, and a gradual closing of the economy. And the effects won't be great, but they're not going to be that large. Um, and um, eventually, they'll do something about it if they realize that they're falling way behind. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Um, next, we have Galina Hill, who will tell us about the financial sector implications of Brexit. Thank you, Maria. Thank you for inviting me to participate in this. Uh most distinguished panel. Um, I'm, uh, I work at the Fed, so the first thing I have to say is that everything I say is my personal opinion. It does not reflect in any way the opinion of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, Federal Reserve System, or anybody else affiliated with it. Um, so, especially since there's gonna be a lot of speculative kind of thoughts in what I'm gonna say. So, all my personal ideas. Um, so, in terms of impact on finance, I guess it's not a surprise for anybody that financial sector is very important for the UK, especially for the city of London. Uh, London has been a financial hub in, for many, many years. Um, overall, I looked up some numbers. Financial sector, prior to the global financial crisis, contributed about 10% to the UK GDP in terms of value added. That share has declined somewhat in recent years. It's about 7%. Uh, which is the most dramatic decline, by the way, across all the countries. So financial system in the UK is more volatile than in countries like Germany or the US, where there is much less foreign presence than in the UK. And I'll return to that. Uh, importantly, financial sector generates about 11% of tax revenues uh, as of the last data point. So that's an argument that the bankers are using today when they talk to the British government. Uh, trying to convince them to negotiate uh, the ability for them to continue operate in the European Union. Um, it employs about 2 million people and about 700,000 people uh, in London. These are people that are directly involved in finance, involved in legal services and other uh, consulting services that uh, support finance industry. Another important contribution of financial sector in the UK is to its um, a trade balance. Uh, the financial sector produces a lot of service exports and generates 3.2% of GDP of trade surplus. So while the UK generally overall has a trade deficit, uh, if not for financial sector, the trade deficit would have been a lot larger, an additional 3% of GDP. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. Uh, so with that background, um, you know, first of all, why is that that financial sector is so important in the UK? Uh, because understanding that would kind of uh, help us understand how sticky it is in there, how likely it is to go away, or is it going to stay despite the Brexit? So, um, his, you know, it, it's, it's a long history, and Barry probably knows it a lot better than I do. 
But UK legal system has been uh, for a long time much more liberal, especially for financial service industry. The labor laws and the uh, financial regulation were much more attractive, especially for the international institutions to place their European base in London as opposed to another place uh, in Europe. Uh, that, that's, that's one factor. Another factor is, you know, prior to World War II, the pound was the global currency, or was it even before that? Um, and uh, uh, it still remains quite an important currency in the international financial transactions especially. And uh, that's an additional reason for um, financial operations to work through London. And the combination of these factors and in addition the strong network externality that works in the financial sector, just like in IT, the reason there's so much information technology in the Silicon Valley is because there are benefits from firms uh, doing roughly the same stuff locating in the same place. That uh, network externality is very strong in the financial sector because uh, financial institutions have to deal with each other a lot. They rely on the same uh, legal and other support services a lot. And so locating together all in one city, uh, that's a financial services hub, has a beneficial effect for everybody and improves efficiency of the system. And that's why we observe those financial hubs all around the world, like in Hong Kong and Tokyo and New York. Um, so as a result of this, um, of all the financial firms in the world that have headquarters in Europe, half of these headquarters are in London. So when firms outside of the European Union choose where they want to have a presence in Europe, they, half of them choose to go to London. They also, if they don't have direct European presence, many financial firms work with the UK-based firms if they want to have business in Europe. So it's a very important hub for any financial operations that go into and out of Europe. So given that, uh, what would Brexit uh, bring to that situation? Well, first of all, uh, it really depends on how Brexit is gonna play out. What Andy said uh, in the last couple of minutes of his remarks, it's really not clear where we are going to land and, uh, you know, I kind of agree that the status quo would probably be the best case, but it's also not very likely. And so what's on the table for negotiations that's important for financial industry? The things that are discussed quite a bit are, of course, labor mobility as one of the main premises for the Brexit vote, regulation, which was also quite a bit in this uh, pro-Brexit ads. Um, the, the UK didn't want to have the stringent regulation imposed from the European Union. And not discussed so much, but potentially, you know, when there are negotiations happening, capital mobility might end up on the table as well. So what would that imply for the London being the financial hub of the world? Or at least in the European part of the world. Um, bankers have already expressed their concerns about the barriers to labor mobility. Financial industry relies on large numbers of high skilled, skilled professionals. If there are barriers to come and work in the UK, they will have a hard time finding sufficient number of highly skilled professionals to hire. Currently, a lot of people working in London are not UK nationals. Um, so that would definitely, they would be able to get visas for them, but it would increase the cost of hiring, um, hiring foreigners, uh, much like the U U US companies have to face these costs. Um, so that would make incentives, especially for non-UK based firms to relocate to other places where it might be a little bit easier and that it would be elsewhere in the European Union. Dublin is English speaking uh, capital that might be quite attractive in that sense. Frankfurt has already large presence of financial uh, service firms, so network externality potential is there. Uh, or they might just relocate outside of Europe to New York and Hong Kong, which uh, they can operate in Europe from there. Um, another issue discussed is uh, what's called passporting rights. These are the rights for the firms to operate outside the national borders. So for the UK firms to be able to do business in Europe, they need to obtain the passports for each of the activities they have to do. And currently about 5,000 uh, UK companies have those pass passporting rights for EU market, and about 8,000 EU companies have those passporting rights to operate in the UK. 
And uh, if the, the negotiations go the Norway way, those passporting rights will remain. Uh, but if not, uh, the passporting rights will go away if, um, you know, without any trade deals, most likely the WTO rules will apply, which do not provide for passporting rights, which means UK-based firms will have no right to do business in the EU. Uh, if there are any barriers to capital flows, it will increase the cost of moving money across the borders to and from the UK, which would make London a much less attractive financial center. Again, those uh, issues will create incentives to relocate for financial companies, especially those that are foreign owned. So UK national companies might have to open uh, their affiliates within the EU because they won't be able to operate directly out of London. And the companies that are headquartered elsewhere might choose to relocate their European presence away from London. Um, a lot of uh, financial operations going through London are actually not in British Pound. Uh, a lot of dollar operations are going through London. So while there might be some effect on the role of British Pound, I don't necessarily see it as a large effect. Um, but that, of course, remains to be seen. Um, if, if the incentives to relocate are strong, and a lot of firms do relocate, then this network externality that we currently have uh, can potentially disappear. If enough firms leave, there won't be enough of a concentration left to create those network externalities. And this is a not very likely scenario, uh, but it's kind of what I think is the worst, worst case scenario is that London actually losing its status as the hub for international financial transactions. Uh, if that starts happening, it can happen pretty fast. Now, um, the offsetting factor potentially could be regulation. In the first place, London attracted um, uh, foreign businesses because of uh, flexible regulation, especially for the financial sector. If it's going to continue to be that way, especially in comparison by the uh, European Union uh, standards and the EU, potentially it can attract uh, um, financial services despite the barriers that they might have with the EU. And they might not have many barriers vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. So say if their labor mobility with respect to EU is restricted, maybe they'll have a more permissive labor migration laws with the US or something like that, and then they'll be able to hire people from the US. But this is uh, really in the kind of, we don't know at all. Uh, two more factors that um, are of concern um, in the immediate future. One is the uncertainty. We know that uncertainty is bad for the economy in general, and it's bad for decision making. Um, it's very difficult to make decisions, especially the decisions for growth, uh, when you don't know what's going to happen. And we don't know what's going to happen, and we're not going to know what's going to happen for quite some time. Uh, and also potential legal complexity of um, whatever kind of political agreement is going to be made can also raise the cost uh, of doing business. Okay. So finally, the question I was asked, uh, what does it all mean for the US? Shall we care? Um, well, one thing that we know is that UK is an important destination for uh, foreign business of the US banks. I have a bunch of numbers, but probably the most impressive is that of all the foreign, foreign, of all the money raised by foreign offices of the US banks, 55% are raised in the UK. And if you count the ones that are raised not in the local currency of wherever the branch is located, 65 of those are raised in the UK. So a lot of dollar deposits uh, the US banks are collecting from UK residents. Uh, they're also uh, you know, trading a lot of derivatives and uh, making a lot of loans in the UK, especially not in pound, in dollar. Um, so if that becomes really costly to conduct business in the, in the UK, US banks might want to move to Dublin or Frankfurt to continue their um, European uh, operations. I don't think it's necessarily going to have a big impact on the businesses of the US banks. 
Uh, definitely, there will be temporary costs of, you know, legal costs and relocation costs, um, and some loss of efficiency potentially. Um, So, in the long run, I think, um, in terms of banking business in the U.S., no matter how it plays out in, in Europe, the banks will be able to adjust and not necessarily suffer uh, tremendous costs. Um, one important risk uh, that all this arises is, is if there is a big disruption to financial markets. Um, for whatever reason, if negotiations are not going in the calm way that people hope they would, and there is uh, some panic in the financial market in Europe and the UK, these shocks tend to transmit quite a bit to the US markets. For example, um, in 2011, when the European debt crisis uh, increased spreads dramatically in Europe, it translated into about an uh, increase of 75% of that magnitude in the uh, uh, corporate bond spreads in the US. And that's a pretty large number. So financial market disruptions that might accompany uh, the political process, the negotiation process, uh, could be costly to the US economy as well. Um, meanwhile, there is definitely an effect of uncertainty um, on business as usual as well for everybody. Uh, because everybody is cautious at making decisions. And so there's definitely a slowdown in anything that has to do with the UK because we don't know what's going to happen. Thank you very much. Um, let me now turn the microphone to Professor Barry Eichengreen, who will address the macroeconomic implications of Brexit. Thank you to um, Maria and to Klaassen and to Haas for this interesting event in this interesting room in this interesting location. We're uh, in the home of the Golden Bears, and I can't but notice that there are some inspirational slogans on the walls. The one at the back of the room is especially appropriate for our uh, uh, meeting, question the status quo, but I notice also there's one uh, beside it that the Brits might have remembered when they went to the polls. Confidence without attitude, it reads. So um, I was asked uh, to talk about the short-term macroeconomics, which one can't really do without slides. So here are a few. There is a big debate about these um, consequences. Uh, the experts at, at, at one of the credit rating services, Moody's, uh, put out a forecast about a month ago, um, illustrated on the right, which sees UK growth slowing down only very modestly. And indeed, the numbers that we've seen so far from the UK have been relatively good. So we have something called the Purchasing Managers Index, which is an indication of their uh, in, in investment and, and, and production activity. We have a, a measure of construction activity in, in, in the UK. And they have been, been surprisingly good. They have been surprisingly good against the backdrop of the relatively pessimistic forecasts that many people were making before the referendum and, and immediately after, and uh, I, in, I include myself, uh, many of us thought that this would be a macroeconomic disaster because of the uncertainty that Galena talked about, uh, because of the potential disruption to trade that Andy talked about, because of the um, depressing effects of foreign direct investment into the United Kingdom because of the uh, um, uncertainty about what was going to happen, which might extend for a long period of, uh, of years. So why we haven't seen more of a, a slump so far, I think, is uh, an, an important question that we don't have completely convincing answers to. We don't have con completely convincing answers uh, uh, about why the effects have been limited so far and whether or not they will grow uh, going forward because, as you've already heard, this is a very complicated question with a lot of dimensions. It's very hard to model. Uh, therefore, it's very hard to hold everything else constant when you're thinking about the effects uh, of Brexit and what happens next will depend importantly on the policy response which we haven't seen yet either 
in uh, the UK or uh, the European Union. So having said that, uh, um, I too think that it's useful to try to distinguish the different channels through which uh, the referendum result might uh, affect the economy. And, and we've heard about the most important ones. I think, number one, uh, a likely fall in investment due to uh, the rise in uncertainty about what the post-referendum situation uh, will be. And in my view, that should be the main channel that will matter in the relatively short run this year, next year, et cetera. The reduction in trade uh, that may or may not occur as a result of the difficulty of negotiating uh, market access for uh, British exports, the decline in immigration that the UK is likely to experience as a result of the, the new regime, and finally the policy response again will be important for either magnifying or, or uh, moderating the effects. There is one effort of which I'm aware out there to try to quantify UK policy uncertainty um, due to uh, Baker et al. So this is uh, an index that um, uh, work in this area being sophisticated runs off the number of times the word uncertain or un un uncertainty is used in newspaper articles relative to the uh, the amount of newsprint that's um, uh, being considered. And you can see that the word count went up quite considerably even before the referendum. There was uncertainty about the outcome and then there was uncertainty about what would follow the outcome. The level of uncertainty so measured roughly uh, tripled over the year or so leading up to uh, uh, the referendum. And these authors argue they show in various ways that this index does seem to be correlated over time with things we care about, like the level of investment and the performance of the macroeconomy. So what uh, happened then was a further five-fold increase. The blue line uh, jumps up around the time of the referendum, after which the index falls back down to where it had been in May of 2016 in the uh, immediately preceding month. So there was a big spike in, in uncertainty and anxiety at the time of the referendum that seems to have uh, dissipated to a considerable extent, to my surprise, certainly. But it's important to remember that, it has, that this measure has declined to the already elevated level that it had reached in May of 2016, up very considerably from what had been typical before. So these same authors uh, in a series of papers, as I said, have used this index to try to explain things of interest like uh, the behavior of industrial production. So they have a, a simple model. They shock the uncertainty index. They see how industrial production responds. And their analysis suggests that an observed, the observed three times increase in uncertainty in the UK over the year uh, leading up to the referendum should be associated with a seven uh, point drop, seven percent drop in industrial production, and then a, then a bit of a recovery. So if you believe these results, this is kind of a, uh, a lot of Andy's hamburgers. This is a, a pretty big deal. Um, then we have the, 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 the perplexing fact that investment seems to have held up relatively well so far. So I'm, I'm not sure exactly uh, how we understand that. Economists sometimes use an accelerator model that makes uh, investment a function of the change in output as well as other things. And we haven't seen the change in output yet, so maybe we haven't uh, seen much of the investment response. Maybe investment has been stabilized or smoothed by the Bank of England's early and forceful response when it uh, cut interest rates and it reacted, reactivated uh, quantitative easing and a program called funding for lending where they give money to the banks cheaply if the banks turn around uh, and, and, and lend it. But if you think as I think that output will con continue to fall or begin to fall 
in the future, there now being limited space for the Bank of England to do more, and maybe that fallen output will make up the lost ground, make up for the delayed start, then uh, I think there's still grounds to be pessimistic about how the economy will uh, respond. Trade and growth, um, I should probably skip these slides. We want to know what the impact of Brexit will be on UK trade, and we don't know yet. We want to know also what the impact of trade on growth is. So the study that I found was from the Center for, for European Reform. I guess they're a pro-EU uh, uh, think tank, and they come up with large estimates of how much UK trade will suffer from um, leaving uh, the European Union. One, you know, if, if they really do lose access to the sing, free access to the single market, you also have to know things like how, how much of that trade will be redirected successfully to other markets. To what extent will sterling continue to weaken, allowing them to crowd in more exports to other places? And again, that's a, a, a big and complicated um, question. UK exports are 28% of GDP. If you believe the Center for European Reform, they could fall by almost a third, 8.4% of UK GDP. If you believe Frankel and Romer about how, how much trade contributes uh, to growth, that, that again implies a, a, a big hit to um, GDP. And then there are those longer run dynamic effects that we can't measure confidently, but, but we think uh, uh, exist. Will a weaker exchange rate help? The pound has already fallen from like $1.32 to like $1.16 in response in the immediate aftermath of the referendum. And the models that the Bank of England has historically used suggest that a fall uh, of sterling of that magnitude should boost UK exports by about 1% of uh, GDP. Not boost exports, but not boost, um, yeah, let me leave it at that. Um, these models are, are, are useful, though, only if the historical relationship continues to hold. And uh, the current, current environment is different from the historical environment. Global growth is weak. Uh, hidden forms of protectionism are on the rise. Global trade is stagnating. It's not clear that Britain's ability to use uh, the exchange rate to crowd, crowd in exports will work as powerfully in the future as it has in the past. Finally, uh, the policy response. As I said, the Bank of England has done a lot uh, so far. Uh, I think it's unlikely that the bank will be uh, forced to reverse course by an acceleration in inflation. Uh, sterling's depreciation will lead to some temporary increase in uh, import prices and inflation, but the bank doesn't only look at temporary things. It will, I think, look through the headline, uh, increase in headline inflation and not um, panic. But I also think that slightly lower interest rates or more quantitative easing are unlikely to help much when the main course of the economic slow, main cause of the economic slowdown in the U.S., uh, the main cause of the recession, is high uncertainty, which makes firms reluctant to uh, invest. Um, fiscal policy: the new chancellor has told his public that there will be no austerity budget prior to the referendum. One of the threats made by the then incumbent government was that they believed strongly in budget balance and Brexit would lead to a decline in tax revenues, so there would have to be a further decline in government spending. The new chancellor has said not necessarily, which I think is good news, but otherwise we're waiting to see um, what they do. I'm of the view, actually, unlike the two preceding uh, speakers, that it's more likely than not that Brexit means Brexit and they, they will go there, but they're not going to go there anytime soon, that uh, they're not going to activate Article 50, which starts the clock on the two-year negotiating process with the EU at the beginning of next year or anytime 
Soon they've got to hire those trade negotiators. They've got to hire a bunch of barristers to uh, design all the laws affecting their domestic market that are governed by EU law that uh, they're going to have to replace. So I think they're in for an extended uh, um, period of uncertainty. And, and as everybody has emphasized, there is nothing that investors like less than an extended period of uncertainty. So far, we have quite, uh, quite some agreement about the negative effects of Brexit. We turn now to Professor Gerard Roland to explain and talk to us about the political economy uh, aspects of Brexit. So uh, first thing I'd like to say is that uh, uh, if the economic uncertainty is, is quite large, uh, I think the political uncertainty is is probably uh, even larger, and and so um, we can imagine all sorts of scenarios, you know, and they're contingent on many other things, you know. What is the world going to look like in November 9th? Nobody knows, but we know that's very uncertain, uh, and it could lead to 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 all sorts of things. So so. Given that, you know, I don't want to go in all sorts of of directions and. Uh, uh, I, I maybe want to try to put a positive spin on this because there's lots of negative scenarios. I'm generally not a believer in the theory that crises are a good thing, that crises are an opportunity to fix things because a crisis is a crisis. People are hurt under crisis. Bad things can happen under crisis. Truly, sometimes good things can happen, but uh, that's not necessarily uh, the rule. So very few remarks, and then, then you know, we'll uh, go directly to the debate. Uh, uh, about the consequence of this. First thing is that I think now it's very unlikely that there will be further referenda in other uh, EU countries. Uh, the incumbent leaders have understood how catastrophic uh, this uh, referendum was. You know, usually you do a referendum. You know, the the you you there's a specific question, a specific reform. Uh, if the answer is no, if people reject it, then basically it's the status quo. Here, do we want uh, to stay in the uh, uh, EU? And then the answer is no, but nobody knows how the divorce is going to happen. It turns out that negotiating the divorce seems more complicated than negotiating a marriage. So, so uh, 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 that's, that's one thing. So I think, I think many other countries have understood that Brexit has created an extremely large political crisis uh, in the UK. Uh, within days of the result, the whole uh, conservative leadership was in uh, tatters. Uh, Mrs. May, you know, is going to have to follow up on that. She said Brexit means Brexit, but she's really in a difficult uh, uh, position. Uh, uh, and um, uh, so, so uh, uh, many European leaders have said it would be a folly uh, to do something similar, because even if they think when they launch a referendum that they would be winning, you know, that's exactly what David Cameron thought and it ended to be a catastrophe. Uh, uh, in Holland, uh, there was a popular referendum on the uh, association agreement with Ukraine and it was rejected, partly because of, you know, a lot of uh, pro-Putin propaganda, uh, but the participation, participation rate was only 32%. So, so what do you make of that? I predict that in countries where it's easy to make a referendum, there might be even legislation to make it more difficult because this is, this is quite uh, uh, destabilizing. Second thing, second remark, is that uh, uh, Brexit over time uh, may actually uh, show to people more concretely uh, the advantages of being inside Europe and the disadvantages of, of leaving. And for, for many people, it can be concrete. It can be for students uh, who cannot participate in European programs of, of exchange. It can be for researchers who participate in the ERC. It can be, you know, so many. It can be for the financial sector, you know, and the list is, 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 is very large for people who will uh, uh, see it negatively, uh, up to the point that already we have been seeing many uh, uh, British citizens asking, scrambling to try and get you know, EU passports. So, so the, there's already an understanding there. And, and this can be important because in a way people take the EU for granted. They think, yeah, that's the status quo, that's really bad. 
you know, anything else can be better, but no, actually, <laughs> many things can, can be uh, 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 very bad. A third thing that I think is really important that can change the dynamics of politics within the EU is that with the Brexit vote, the UK has irrevocably lost its bargaining power within the European Union. And so the, the, the UK was always in this position that they didn't really like very much the European integration process, but they really wanted to be inside so as to influence it, so as to make sure that the EU would not have too deep integration. Uh, uh, and, and they have played that role. And, and you know, many people who feel the same way you know, in Scandinavian countries or you know, in other countries thought that the, the UK was, was a very uh, useful uh, 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 member, uh, uh, at least in, in, in pushing for not too far integration. Uh, uh, that's completely lost for the UK. So the very best scenario one can imagine, which is the Norway uh, scenario, which is not going to happen, as Andy explained, even if they had the Norway scenario, they would still have zero, zero political power within the EU. And for them, that was something uh, so, so important. And, and why is that? Because, you know, uh, they always, when they were negotiating, they said, well, if you don't do this, if you don't follow us, then we might leave the EU. And that was a big threat. Well, now they voted for it, they're outside, so what else, what else can happen? And, and it is true that as much as on the EU side, uh, uh, there is, you know, you have different opinions. You have Schadenfreude with some people, not with others, but I, I don't think there is a will to really punish hardly the British citizens, but it is also the case that there's really no hurry to please the British, because they have no bargaining power. They have no bargaining power, so, so the, the Europeans uh, 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 can take their time to negotiate. They would like uncertainty to be resolved, like everybody else, because they are hurt as much as the British are hurt, but they're not more in a hurry than the British. So as, as Barry said, uh, uh, things could take a long time, and it's not the EU that is necessarily going to uh, accelerate it, even though uh, they, might, they might want to. And, and actually, so we don't know exactly how the divorce is going to look like. One thing I think is sure that uh, um, possibly, you know, because one thing that could happen is after a number of years, they said, hey, you know, we've changed our mind. We want to go back to the EU. But then I think, you know, the Europeans would say, well, we'll take you back, but, but you have to be less Eurosceptic. And so, so there have to be some uh, uh, political uh, uh, change uh, uh, for that. Uh, uh, next remark is that, um, and this is pretty obvious, uh, uh, is that the Brexit crisis should really serve as a wake-up call for uh, 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 internal EU action on, on several fronts. And I would just name here two. One is the refugees and two is the internal uh, EU governance. Right now we have a situation where uh, Angela Merkel is the de facto leader of the EU. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, she, she's a very strong personality. There are, you know, many positive things uh, about it, but because of her leadership and because of German's leadership in the EU, the way the 2008 crisis was handled has been catastrophic, and we're still paying the price for it. We're seeing it in Spain, we're seeing it in Italy, we're seeing it in Greece, we've seen it in the UK. Uh, we're going to see it in election outcomes, certainly for years to come. And, and so, so uh, that's, that's uh, certainly one thing. The refugee crisis, uh, uh, now, uh, you know, the, the Brexit is not really because of the refugees, because, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the notion was we don't want immigration, but a lot of that was against the Poles and the Romanians, and, and uh, 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 so, so th th there is this, uh, um, there, there is this sort of, uh, uh, um, you know, rejection, rejection of openness uh, that takes place among people who are uh, economically poor, and you see something similar going on in the uh, uh, U.S. right now. But you know, on the refugee crisis, so for example, you know, there are there are uh, uh, there are um, you know, founded criticism. Angela Merkel. Uh, as much as she wanted to be generous on the refugee policy, as much as she was on the right side, she did not consult other European partners. That has created problems. The German government was taken by surprise. Wir schaffen das, but you know it's hard, it's it's hard even for well-organized Germans to to integrate so many refugees so quickly, and it's it's creating uh, uh, problems in in uh, uh, Germany. So, so uh, that's that's certainly uh, uh, um, that's certainly a, a big problem. 
and, and uh, so the last thing I would say is, is on governance. So, so on governance, uh, uh, there are problems. Uh, so in a way, uh, um, people have invoked very often democratic deficits. But democratic deficit in the European Union was never smaller than it is now. The European Union has a democratically elected leader. That's Jean-Claude Juncker. Most people just don't know about it. But Jean-Claude Juncker was elected according to the German electoral system, where each party puts up a Spitzenkandidat, who's going to be the candidate's commission president. And he was the candidate of the EPP. And I think people in Germany understand that, because they know that's, that's, how, that's how politics works in Germany. But if you ask in any other country, you know, and I can see on people's faces here in the room, uh, that's so, so he was elected. Now, uh, um, the, the, what this raises is that maybe this governance system is not the right one for Europe. Uh, 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 Barry and I and some others, uh, many years ago, when there was talk about European constitution, we, we thought what would be a good European constitution. And then we thought, I, I don't know if you still agree with that, we thought at the time that it might be good to have an elected president uh, of the European Union, because then that would create more competition and one would be sure that, that you would have maybe a higher quality uh, politician who, who would have some qualities of leadership who would uh, uh, be felt as being truly the uh, uh, elected uh, leader. And, and uh, uh, we thought that some kind of electoral college system at the European level could create flexibility in, in uh, uh, doing this. So, so um, is it too late? I don't think so. I think, I think Europe still faces uh, uh, its uh, uh, governance. Uh, um, apart uh, from that, you know, I, don't, I don't really see in which, uh, direction, um, in which other direction one, one can go. Uh, I just think it's quite worrying to see that among young people, uh, they take for granted uh, that the EU is just the status quo, that uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, EU has created um, an area of prosperity, of peace, of uh, uh, openness, etc. Uh, uh, because the, 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 even though now with Brexit, the, uh, um, the anti-status quo has not yet materialized, there can still be quite nasty things that, that may occur, and, and history has taught us that. So I think there's, there's only one way forward, which is to for the EU to, to get its act together and to try to you know, rejuvenate itself. Thank you. So we have just a few minutes left, so I would like to open the floor for questions. Um, there is a microphone in the, um, in the front here, so if anybody would like to ask a question, please step up. Thank you. Thank you. So, Professor Roland, at the end you talked about not just the consequences for Britain, but for the European Union, and you cited governance and the refugee crisis. I'm wondering if the panel could also speak to the consequences for Brexit on the financial crises that are occurring in the rest of Europe or are likely to occur. Uh, I'm reading a lot of articles about the Italian banks and the sad state they're in, and uh, the Greek financial system is still uh, not in a good state. I was hoping if you could speak, because the British have been in the past in favor of less integration, as you mentioned, and in favor of a more German model of um, financial responsibility. Now that that voice is gone, do you think it's going to have a, a consequence on how uh, Brussels handles these crises? It's you. <laughs> I guess that's me, my own personal views. Um, so, so I think going, let me backtrack. Basically, going back about a year, uh, banking system in Europe took a turn for the worse. And the most prominent of that is the troubles that Deutsche Bank is having, as well as the Swiss banks, and of course the uh, banks in the European periphery that basically never recovered from the global financial crisis. So that's the background uh, on which this Brexit vote uh, shock took place. So when the Brexit vote surprise happened, the stock prices of all the banks, not just European banks, plunged, uh, US banks as well. US banks have recovered completely since then, and 
their stock prices are trading higher than they did on uh, you know weeks before Brexit. Uh, Brexit vote. Um, European banks um, have not really recovered, and the credit spreads that they're paying uh, have remained elevated uh, relative to what we observed before. And generally, there, I kind of see that the trend down has continued. I don't think it's necessarily has much to do with the Brexit vote per se. I think it's the banking troubles now. Uh, maybe I'll pass it to Barry to talk about how the regulation might be affected. Well, I would um, add one thing about the short run and one about the longer run. In the short run, it, it is important to remember that the UK is less important for the EU than the other way around. That nonetheless, uh, th th there is this cloud of uncertainty, not only over the UK, but, uh, but over the uh, European economy more broadly, that is going to force the European Central Bank to keep interest rates low and indeed negative, which is not good for the banks. So one thing that's compounding the difficulties the banks are having is that the European economy is weak. Uh, there's not enough investment. Interest rates are too low for comfort for uh, the banks. In the longer run, there's the possibility uh, of a banking union that Europe needs uh, a single supervisor, which it almost has. It needs a, a, a way of resolving the difficulties of broken banks, which it thinks it has, but it doesn't really quite yet. And it needs a single deposit insurance scheme like we have in the United States with a dedicated financial backstop. So maybe the com these difficulties as they unfold will um, lead the Europeans to identify banking union as one of the projects they can unite around. Thank you. Would any other uh, question? Yeah, please step up to the mic. Thank you for a great discussion. Uh, my question is uh, for Professor Gerard Rollin. I'm curious about uh, uh, the EU's unity when you mentioned, is, is it even possible for somebody from, let's say, Greece or Spain to be the president of the EU? Is, is it that fair, the system? And uh, Europeans, do you believe that they do feel uh, one? Because I'm, I'm actually visiting from London Business School, and there was a lot of debate around this in the last few months. I just would like to get your opinion on that. Uh, why not? Right now you have a de facto German uh, uh, and many people may, uh, may object to that, but, um, um, you, know, uh, you know, somebody like Donald Tusk might do a good job, for example. So that's just to name, to name one example. Uh, uh, maybe at some point, you know, Matteo Renzi, if he's successful in turning around Italy, we still have to see it because he's having a referendum of his own on December 4th, but, but uh, uh, it's, 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 not, uh, it's, it's certainly not impossible. It's um, sometimes said that the single most important force making for a European identity is Ryanair. That <laughs> y young people have more of a European identity because they've grown up flying around the continent. I just have a quick question for Dr. Hale. Do you think there will be a specific event that will occur that will indicate to the banks in London that it's time to start moving? And, and do you have any sense of when they'll start making that decision? <laughs> well, the pa the, any kind of resolution on passporting right would be a one event that can trigger an exodus. Uh, in the absence of that, if there's long drawn discussion about whether it might or might not, will or will not happen, that can also trigger exodus. And we know that financial markets tend to move as a herd. And so if it does happen, it may happen quickly, even without a triggering event. We have time for one more question. Here we have, would you introduce yourself? Yes. Thank you. So, uh, Emanuele, I'm an exchange from uh, uh, Barcelona, ETAS. So uh, I'm, I'm more curious to know, um, 
because this vote basically divided the England. So bankers voted for yes, and the workers voted for uh, for exit, more or less. Um, and then we have seen across Europe the rise of the populist parties. Uh, I'm more uh, interested to know which is your view uh, in this um, moment of the political scene in Europe, and how do you see this vote had an impact in the rise of these populist movements? So, so I, I think I, I you know, mentioned the, the two, two big shocks. One is the uh, Great Recession, which has hurt uh, Europe uh, much more than it has the U.S., and it has hurt the U.S. badly. Don't, don't misunderstand that. You know, seven million people lost their house, eight million people lost their job, but there was a much faster policy reaction. Uh, in Europe, uh, austerity was the answer. That was the German answer. That was the British answer, by the way. The British have been pushing for austerity since the beginning. And uh, uh, of course, you know, there are uh, consequences of that. Uh, you know, you come from Barcelona, just see how Spain was, was uh, hurt badly by what's happening. See how difficult it is now, you know, to, to having a, a government. Uh, and, and so I think, I think that's certainly uh, uh, one, uh, one big element. Uh, uh, the refugee crisis to a certain extent, so you can see it in Germany with uh, AfD, uh, uh, IFD actually initially started as a party that was not, you know, anti-refugee. They were more, uh, uh, we don't want to subsidize, you know, other European countries, you know, Germany first, etc. Uh, 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 you know, but 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 it has uh, it has changed, and that's certainly uh, that's certainly an important factor. Now, uh, one thing I, I need to say, and this is a little bit different, and there's a really sharp difference between the attitudes towards refugees in Eastern Europe and in Western Europe. I mean, in Western Europe, the Germans have taken you know, most of the cost. Uh, the British have not uh, taken it. The French haven't taken much of a cost. So the Italians have taken, you know, we can sort of you know, go on. But the Hungarians, the Poles, you know, and they, they said, no, 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 we don't, want, uh, we don't want any refugee, and we certainly don't want any Muslim. Uh, uh, now, that can complicate things. And so, for example, Putin is playing on that. Putin uh, boasts that he already has uh, four or five uh, uh, heads of state of European Union countries in his pocket, including Viktor Orban, uh, you know the Czech, the, the you know the the, the Czech, the uh, um, Slovak president, you know Romanian, and we can we can talk, and not including you know Mr. Farage, Mrs. Le Pen, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So it's clear that there's a push from Putin, and that that's that's you know in, involving propaganda. Uh, uh, you know, very active propaganda. You know, the, the Russians were those who said that Trump won the debate on, on, on Monday. You could see that all those tweets emanated from the St. Petersburg area. Anyway, so, so, so uh, 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 in this case too, but, but it's not that simple because Poland is very conservative, but Poland clearly is not in the hands of Putin. So there, there is room of maneuver uh, uh, for the EU. And, and so EU politicians are used to discuss and making compromise, and, and I, I really think that even on the refugee situation, uh, compromises are possible. I don't want to insist too much on that. I want to say that on that very positive note, I must thank Dr. Uh, Hale and Professors Rose Eichengreen and Roland for this excellent debate. Thank you. Thank you.